So let's start the conference. I will introduce the first chairman of the session. You probably know him very well. So this is Christian Pedrini. He was the chairman with Marie Geneviève Blanchin of the Eurodim 94 in Lyon. And he will chair the, the first session. Christian. Okay, so I am very glad to to be the chairman of this uh, first session, also of this first invited talk. The speaker is Charles Thiel from Montana State University. It's working, yes? Oh, yes. Uh, in Bosman, okay? And so you propose to, to talk about uh, design and characterization of materials of reverse quantum memories. And um, there are several uh, co-workers. And in the list of these uh, co-workers, I remark that there are two well-known people, Roger McFerlane and Rufus Cohn. So up to you, please, Charles. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Christoph and the uh, organizing committee for inviting me to this very nice conference and to visit Lyon again, which is one of my favorite places to visit. And particularly for a lot of you visiting from around the world, uh, I highly recommend the cuisine. It's got excellent food in Lyon. Uh, and so you really have a, a great time to look forward to in that respect. So to start out with, I give a little bit of background about uh, our group and the kind of work that we've done historically, our focus area has typically been on uh, very high resolution spectroscopy, including both uh, traditional spectroscopy as well as coherent spectroscopy. Uh, and so in particular, over the years, we've measured the, the narrowest optical line width in a solid in Erbium YSO of 73 hertz, and that's on a transition that has a frequency of uh, 150 terahertz. So a very, very high quality factor. Um, and so and Bozeman is a very unusual place, uh, and that leads directly into the work that we do. Uh, and so over the years, as even though Bozeman is a very small town of only about 40,000 people in the city and the surrounding area, we have an unusually large number of optics communities. Per capita, we probably have the largest optics community in the United States. Uh, and so this started back in the, uh, let's see which one is the laser. So with uh, Rufus Cohen arriving in Bozeman in 1974, he was the ver first person in the city or the university working professionally in the area of optics and photonics. Uh, and then the whole range of companies started being established, some independently and some as spinoffs from the university. And so what this has led to is this huge expansion uh, up into recent times where we have currently more than 30 optics companies in Bozeman, and we have currently a, a growth rate of 13% uh, or higher. And this translates, if you work out how many people work in these industries, more than 1% of the population of Bozeman and the surrounding area is working directly in the optics and photonics region out of everyone. And so it's very, very uh, large number of people. And so that's influenced the work that we do, and particularly the materials work the, and uh, development because there's a large number of interactions between the university as well as the, uh, the local industries. Uh, historically, one of the first uh, very successful and productive collaborations is with Scientific Materials Corporation, uh, which is a company that was founded in Bozeman in 1989 by Ralph Hutchison, uh, who is uh, well known. He's the person, while he was working at Union Carbide, who grew the very first uh, ruby crystal that was used by Ted Maiman in the first laser system. Uh, Hank had decided to move to Bozeman because he liked the area and he was, uh, got his degree in Bozeman and so he uh, came and started up a company growing high quality laser materials with the idea that he could take scientific uh, understanding of materials in the growth process to improve the quality and the consistency of laser materials, uh, particularly in those early days for very high power neodymium YAG lasers. 
So we've worked quite a bit with them, and it's an incredibly useful uh, capability to have a company right in town that grows high-quality materials, which can interact and feedback directly with the research process that goes on at the university. Also in uh, 2005, based on the work by uh, Rufus and uh, the others in, in Bozeman, uh, the very active area of spectral hole burning and rare earth materials for photonic signal processing led to the founding of a company called S2 Corporation that uh, is focused on commercializing spectral hole burning type applications, optical coherent transients, uh, to do very high bandwidth sort of pro optical processing that can't be done electronically. Uh, and again, this leads directly into the development of materials and a lot of the same issues that they deal with in trying to commercialize this technology apply directly to the issues that have to be dealt with trying to apply these materials to quantum information uh, applications. Uh, another company in Bozeman is uh, uh, ADVR, who uh, focuses on integration and nonlinear optics, waveguide type physics. Um, they are a very large commercial supplier of uh, waveguide devices, including both uh, nonlinear optics as well as modulators and such. Uh, in particular, they, they do uh, sell products such as entangled photon pair sources as well as optical con frequency conversion devices, which are also critical aspects of quantum information type applications. Uh, and finally, the last company I'll mention is Montana Instruments, which is founded in 2009. And this company was spun out of the development that went on at S2 Corporation, where they'd realized that cryostat technology had really not advanced very much in recent years. And then for all of these applications, you need you know, very low temperatures, low vibrations, and very convenient systems uh, that can be integrated well with all these other type of applications, such as integrated optics from ADVR. And so they, they establish this company and they sell, I, I think I can, without bias, say that they're the most convenient and user-friendly cryostats in the world. I, I see them everywhere that I go in the world now. Um, and this also is an essential uh, benefit when we uh, combine all of this expertise together to uh, try to look at what, what are the aspects that we need when developing the devices and what kind of material considerations go into making something that's practically going to work in, uh, in a device at some point, or at least can potentially be developed into a device. So uh, together at the, the university, we have this unique combination, this synergy of the fundamental scientific research that goes on. And there's a number of institutes, both in the university as well as in the, the industry, such as the Montana mm -hmm. Photonics Alliance and uh, Montana State University Spectrum Lab, where we focus on bringing all the expertise from these groups together and trying to you know, develop something that's really practical and that's going to work. And in particularly, one of my goals and the goals of, uh, of Rufus and, and Roger and the rest of uh, our group is to try to bring in a number of international collaborations of groups that are experts in quantum information and different aspects of these, and then provide an intermediate role where we can combine the expertise of these companies, our university, and provide it to our international collaborators to really develop materials and provide unique capabilities. But in particularly, at the moment, we've got uh, a number of quite active collaborations and regular visits between groups such as Wolfgang Tittle's group in Canada uh, and Philippe Goldner's group in Paris, among others. So in all of these applications, I'll be focusing on the rare earth ions because of their very, very unique properties. So most of the people here at this conference will be quite familiar with these ions. Uh, the lanthanides down at the bottom of the periodic table. Um, and of course, they're used for a wide range of applications. Uh, traditionally, we know them from lasers to scintillators to uh, phosphors. Uh, and the particular applications I'm concerned with are at low temperatures, the very unique properties that you get, and particularly properties that allow you to have very, very good optical coherence, spin coherence, uh, as well as spectral tailoring capabilities that are applied both in classical signal processing as well as now in quantum information type applications. So what makes the rare earth ions so special? What gives them their properties? Uh, first of all, when we start thinking about what kind of materials can we interact with in light that provide a dynamic, um, a capability to have a dynamic interaction between light and a, and a solid state material. 
Uh, first of all, we have to have uh, an unfilled electronic shell. That can either be a color center, uh, which typically couple couples very strongly to the environment, or if we're thinking about ions, that's the transitional elements such as the D electron states or the F electrons. So we're looking at mostly the, these partially vil, uh, filled shells that are, have transitions at low enough energy to uh, provide transitions in the optical regime. So among these, the, the rare earth ions are very special because of the lanthanide contraction because of the, the only partial shielding of the 4F electrons of each other, they see an effectively larger uh, central field from the nucleus, and so this causes the 4F, 4F electrons to be pulled in towards the nucleus, so that even though they're the, outer, the lowest energy shell and only partially filled shell, they're actually within the orbital radi radius of the other uh, lower energy filled shells, the 5S and the 5P. So what this means is when we look at the uh, electronic wave functions, the 4F shell is actually has very, very little extension out beyond the outer regime, so beyond the outer radius of the ion. So you can say these outer electrons provide a buffer between the ligands and the uh, 4F shell so that they have very weak interaction with the environment as opposed to a D electron. And so here's a, a picture of the ionic radii where you can see the average 4F radius is less than half of the radius of the, the traditional ionic radius when thinking about material bonding. So what this means in practice is that the 4F electrons maintain much of the properties of a free ion. They come as close to having an ideal free ion state as you can have in a solid state environment because of the very weak coupling to the environment. And so unlike the cases of the D electrons where they generally participate in the bonding, the 4F electrons are non-bonding states. And you can generally treat the first order picture of thinking of the atomic physics uh, model for the system and then view the lattice as being a weak perturbation on that. So this leads to the whole range of very unique and uh, exciting properties of the rare earth ions that are all uh, critical to their being used for quantum information and other applications as well as the traditional luminescence applications, meaning that you can have very long excited state lifetimes, you can have transitions that are very near the radiative, uh, radiative lifetime, uh, you can have the fluorescence quantum efficiency of near 100%, uh, all of the transition probabilities uh, concentrated in zero phonon lines. Uh, you can have very, very long nuclear spin coherence times, optical coherence times, um, and also you can take these materials and because they couple so weakly to the lattice, they provide an ideal case for understanding systematics as you vary the material properties, how those changes can manipulate and engineer the properties of the rare earth ion. So if we, we take a step back and think at the very basic level, what is the what are the nature of the electronic states that we're dealing with in the rare earth case? Uh, first, you have to think about the traditional atomic physics picture of the rare earth wave functions, where you have the central field, it splits the configurations, then you have the electron-electron interaction as well as the spin-orbit coupling, which splits the uh, Russell Saunders multiplets, then the spin-orbit coupling mixes those multiplets. So in the end, you end up with uh, things that look like atomic uh, wave functions where you have generally labeled by LSJ sort of quantum numbers, although only J is a good quantum number because of the spin orbit coupling is, is quite significant. Now when we take this ion, with, initially with spherical symmetry, we put that into the crystal. The crystal field breaks that symmetry, and now J is no longer a good quantum number, which it, in the end means that the M sub J levels of each multiplet get split into a series of energy levels, sometimes with some remaining degeneracy and some with all the degeneracy completely completely uh, lifted, and so that splitting is typically on the order of hundred wave number, hundreds of wave numbers, uh, and so then you have to consider combinations of the, the initial atomic wave functions that give you the crystal field wave functions. And these wave functions, because the symmetry and how they're, they're broken depends on the environment, that depends very, very strongly on the point symmetry of the rare earth ion. And also, by a direct consequence of that, also depends very sensitively on the perturbations of that environment. And so not only do you have to take into account the symmetry of the environment, you have to take into account any defects in the system that perturb that symmetry, which can change the properties quite, quite dramatically with a, a small effect. And then underneath that, you have the, the interaction between the electronic states and the nucleus, as well as the uh, interactions between the electronic states and the environment 
around it, uh, which are all quite significant. We'll talk about here shortly. So we combine all these effects together. Uh, the first order picture, we have the atomic, picture, uh, atomic physics picture, where each one of these lines corresponds to a uh, multiplet, uh, so labeled typically with an LSJ value, which represents the leading term in the, in the wave function. And so as you can see, the energy levels uh, span a huge range, and there's a very large variety, a very rich spectrum. Uh, in practice, we're focused on the transitions between the ground state and levels that lie within energies of 20,000 wave numbers or less that are, occur at visible wavelengths. And so here you see a lot of the traditional, uh, in red, the laser transitions that everybody's familiar with, such as the neodymium lasers, uh, 1.5 micron at erbium. And then also a lot of these same transitions are ones that are of great interest for uh, uh, spectral hole burning and quantum information applications because of their properties. Uh, and so the ones that have been received the greatest attention in terms of these applications are the ones highlighted with the, uh, the green uh, arrows. So now if we take this big atomic physics picture and we zoom into what the situation is when we go into a crystal, uh, here's an example for a case of erbium and lithium niobate where we're looking at transitions between the very two lowest uh, mul uh, multiplets where we have between this level down here and this, this multiplet down here. When we put it in a crystal, these split into multiple levels that are separated on the order of tens of wave numbers. Um, and then when we look at the absorption spectrum, we see the transition. If we go down to low enough temperature, so only this lowest level is populated, we see transitions from this level to all of this manifold of levels in the 4i13 halves excited state, which gives us an optical spectrum that we can then interpret in terms of the energy level structure and also look for the transitions that were of interest for this kind of application. And so depending on the situation, we have uh, Primarily, for most of the transitions, the, the transitions are electric dipole transitions. So even though they're uh, parity forbidden, you have uh, a breakdown of the parity because of the mixing of the crystal field. And so then that allows you to have what's so-called forced electric dipole transitions, typically with oscillator strengths into the 10 to the minus 6 range. Uh, that also means that your selection rules are dramatically relaxed from the free ion case. Uh, so you nominally have a delta S of zero and L and J of less than six. But then again, remember that uh, these aren't pure Russell Saunders states. And so the S and L are not good quantum numbers, although they do provide a first order guide to which transitions are going to be strong optical transitions. Uh, but also for some transitions, such as the 1.5 micron transition of erbium, you can actually be magnetic dipole allowed. And if, so if they satisfy the the delta J of less than one and the delta S of zero uh, selection rules, in which case you have a transition probability for those particular transitions that are about the same size as the electric dipole, which leads to some interesting consequences in terms of selection rules and properties. Uh, and all of these aspects are very and critical to understand the crystal symmetry uh, and the point symmetry as well as the perturbations of that. So the very first step in understanding and trying to design and manipulate a material for any of these kind of applications is to look at the low temperature spectroscopy and then use a number of basic tools. So absorption spectroscopy, where you look at transitions from the uh, ground state to the excited states. Fluorescence, where you look from the excited states to the ground states. Uh, time dependence. Excitation, where we go in and you can excite subsets of ions in the lattice and distinguish different, different sites. And this is all critical because when you take a, a spectra of these kind of materials, sometimes it's relatively simple like here, and you can see there's differences in the widths of the lines and the intensities of the lines. This is all critical deciding, is this material suitable? Do I have enough oscillator strength in the transition that I'm looking for in order to be useful for an application? But also you have other cases such as erbium and KTP where you look at the spectra and it's just a total mess. And so understanding what, what those lines correspond to is, is critical and takes a relatively intense amount of, of study because a number of these lines are due to different excited states on a single ion, whereas other lines correspond to different subgroups of ions that have different local environments that are perturbed in the lattice. And understanding which is which is very, very important in terms of understanding which transitions are going to have good coherence properties and which transitions are not. 
So starting out at the most basic picture of, you know, what's the first consideration when you're choosing a transition uh, for that will have good coherence properties, uh, good, uh, uh, very slow decoherence, uh, long lifetimes, is to consider that generally we want to look only at levels that are the lowest energy level within each multiplet. And this is because of the coupling of the lattice, you have the ability for energies that are separated by uh, splittings that are comparable to the acoustic phonon energies in the lattice, that they can relax by spontaneously emitting acoustic phonons, and then that typically leads to a relaxation, that relaxation that's very, very fast, particularly when the splittings get large so that you're getting into uh, areas where you have a larger density of phonon states. And so the lifetimes of these levels up here that are higher up in these individual multiplets can be on the order of nanoseconds or picoseconds, which is the reason when you look at a spectrum like this, the levels that get further up get very, very broad. This is simply lifetime broadening from phonon emission. So what this means is generally if we want uh, an ion that's not going to be limited by a, a short lifetime, we need to look at the ground state first of all, and then transitions to this lowest level of the excited state. And of course, that means we need to be able to identify which is the lowest level of the excited state. In some cases, that's not trivial, such as the, the Erbium KTP uh, example that I showed on the earlier slide. And so that's where a lot of the spectroscopic study comes in. Um, now, the next level of complexity is we know that there's uh, broadening due to lifetime effects, and in general, you have homogeneous broadening where all of the ions are broadened by dynamic interactions in the crystal lattice. But at low temperatures, particularly for these lowest levels, lowest transitions where you minimize the relaxation effects, then the slight differences in the crystal lattice, the strain due to variations in the crystalline environment, cause ions at different places in the crystal to have slightly different transition energies. And so what this means is that initially, if, if you had an absolutely perfect crystal with no defects in it, you would have a very narrow, narrow, sharp line that's uh, with the homogeneous line width that's due entirely to dynamics. But in a real crystal, whenever you look at it, even the most perfect crystal, the real line you see is much, much broader. And this corresponds to subgroups of ions with this very narrow line width that have transition frequencies that are at different positions in the line. And this is the key that leads to all of the, the power in terms of spectral hole burning, uh, optical coherent transients, and quantum information type applications with rare earth ions. And so the way you can understand this is if we come in, we have all these subgroups of ions. Now if we have a narrow enough laser or we can uh, do particular um, interactions in the time domain, we have the possibility we can come in and just address ions that are at this particular frequency without talking to ions at other frequencies. This means that we have a very, very large number of spectrally distinct, individually addressable ions in the crystal, which gives the, the material a massive information handling capacity, um, both in terms of parallel, parallelism and other, uh, other properties. And so in a typical crystal, a good single crystal, uh, this line width, this homogeneous line width can be as narrow as 73 hertz, which is as narrow as we've measured, um, and up to, for a single crystal, up to two or 300 gigahertz. And so this means that this information, this number of um, spectrally distinct subgroups can be as large as 10 to the eighth, which traditionally you would think is in classical processing terms as a, a time bandwidth product, uh, which is very, very large. So in practice, the way that you uh, exploit this uh, capability is you use a process of spectral hole burning, where in the simplest case, I can think I have a crystal absorption line, and say I have two levels. I can come in with a narrow band laser, excite the resonant ions up to the excited state, which removes them from the absorption, and then I leave a spectral hole uh, behind or a change in the transmission of the material at that particular frequency. And so then by doing this in selective ways, I can modify the optical absorption of the material selectively, which means that I have a way to dynamically interact between light and the material uh, to do a wide range of uh, processing sort of uh, applications. So there's a, a wide range of uh, 
ways that you can do this besides just the simple two level sort of saturation. You can have uh, multiple levels where you have a metastable level that the population lives for much longer. You can store it in by pumping the nuclear hyperfine states to the hyperfine interaction. You can rearrange the environment. Uh, all of these things give you different advantages and, and capabilities with lifetimes that can vary from milliseconds in the case of two level storage up to weeks or longer in the case of nuclear spin storage. So uh, one of the things that this has been used for, and particularly by S2 Corporation that I've uh, mentioned earlier, is uh, the concept of spatial spectral holography, where you can take the traditional idea of holography, and now you can combine it with the massive multiplexing capacity in the <laughs> spectral domain. Um, and so this allows you to do a wide range of sort of classical signal processing applications. And this also leads to, uh, when you go down to the single entangled photon level, to the quantum information uh, applications as well. So the simplest possible application, which is actually one of the most successful, it's one that uh, uh, S2 Corporation in Bozeman has actually uh, fielded and they've uh, sold a commercial unit to the government to do this, um, and that is spectrum analysis. And so you can think of the material, uh, if you send in an optical spectrum, the uh, the ions at different frequencies will respond to the information on that light at different frequencies, and that information can be recorded into the spectrum of the crystal. So what this means is that you can encode information on an optical carrier using a high bandwidth phase modulator or amplitude modulator, send it to the crystal, the crystal photographically captures that information, and then you can read this out later much slowly with, by scanning a laser, uh, and then t take that information back out to, calc to determine all of the information content that was in that. Uh, yeah. uh, you can also do similar things except in the time domain where you send in complex pulse patterns um, and then by thinking about the Fourier uh, sort of arguments in terms of what the spectrum looks like when those get combined in the material, you can do things like correlation and convolution which can be used for pattern matching uh, radar pro signal processing, ranging information, a whole range of sort of applications. Um, and really the key benefits of this sort of approach to a classical signal processing is that the fact that light can transmit very, very high bandwidth information much more effectively than electronics. So even beyond the, the, the limitations you have of active electronics, even sending a high bandwidth inf information of several gigahertz or more over an electronic cable is very difficult, whereas we know from telecommunications, light has a massive amount of information handling capacity. Um, so that allows you, in principle, to, with these kind of materials, process data up to terahertz of bandwidths, which can either be enti entire terahertz of simultaneous bandwidth or multiplex channels uh, of terahertz that have maybe gigahertz of bandwidths in each cha cha uh, channel. Uh, also, like I said before, it has a unique capability where you photographically capture the frequency spectrum, so unlike a traditional spectrum analyzer, you don't look at each individual channel one at a time, you actually capture the entire spectrum at once so you have no, uh, no uh, danger of missing information that's present. Uh, and also because the crystal, unlike traditional electronics, where that responds to the time dependence, so your, your DIDT or DVDT is what an electronic component responds to, uh, an electronic signal, the rare earth crystal responds intrinsically to the frequency content, which this means there's no such, no, no intermodulation distortion or harmonic distortion or the classic type of uh, problems that plague all electronic type of signal processors. Um, so now if we take this kind of basic picture in this background and we advance that to the quantum regime, there, there's two aspects that we can think about where we encode quantum information now onto the signal that we send into the crystal. Uh, first of all, there's quantum computing, which uh, everybody is familiar with from uh, the popular science type applications. Um, but also in particular, the, what we want to focus on for the rare earths is quantum communication. And so in this idea, uh, what you're doing is you're using the entanglement of photons or other systems, depending on, on which kind of a system you're using, in order to transfer information in a uh, fundamentally, uh, theoretically secure uh, 
uh, way. And so by using the entanglement to transfer the information from one end of the link, there's no possibility that the encryption can be broken or that an eavesdropper can get the information. And also it's fundamentally uh, sound that even if it's stored and in the future somebody develops a quantum computer that can break any classical encryption, still if you use the quantum information to transfer your information, it's still immune to any kind of eavesdropping by even uh, a quantum computer uh, system. So, and one of the things that's very, very useful is that uh, all of the properties that make the rare earth ions ideal for this classical photonic signal processing are exactly the same properties that make them very well suited for these quantum information processing. Um, so, what are some of those properties? One is the, the, ma the massive multiplexing or multidimensional uh, nature of the rare earth interactions with the light. So, you can store light in number of frequency modes. So, that means that if you generate entanglement between different frequencies of the light, the rare earth material can respond to that and, re and store that entanglement. Also, temporal modes, if you look at time bin uh, entanglement between photons arriving at different times, that information can be stored in the material, as well as spatial modes combining the ideas of the holography and the crystal. You can uh, store whatever entanglement between different TEM00 modes or, I mean, TEM modes between of the light, for example, or the polarization states. So you can take the electronic states of the rare earth ions and the, or the nuclear spin states, depending on what properties you're looking at, and you can think of combining them together to be qubits, where you can generate superpositions of the different states to generate whatever quantum state that you're trying to store and also to preserve and store the entanglement. And particularly, one of the advantages of the solid state system and the rare earth kind of ensemble picture in, in particular is that you have a very, very large number of ions in a crystal. And so what this means is that when you send in a lot of photons, so if you're trying to do a practical communication system with a very, very high density and high bandwidth information, if you have a single center such as a, an individual color center like an NV center in diamond, that can store one photon at a time, which means you need a different NV center and a different uh, piece of diamond for every photon that you want to store. The rare earth ion, in principle, rare earth materials can store up to 10 to the 19 photons at the same time. So fundamentally, it has a huge uh, data and throughput capacity. So also with all of the electronic structure, uh, and also the interactions between the nuclear states, the electronic states, and the optical transitions, you can have uh, a wide range of different possibilities for how you interact and store information in the material, which means that you can uh, look at multidimensional qubits, you can do uh, all different protocols that meet the needs of different kinds of applications. And so there's actually a very rich and wide range of different approaches that different groups around the world have for exploring the advantages of the rare earth ion to do quantum information uh, with a number of the, the, some of the leading groups that are listed there, many of which that we, we collaborate regularly. So to provide a little bit of background and a little and, and make a more specific example of what exactly is a quantum, uh, what's involved in a quantum communication system, in this case, we're thinking the rare earth material is being used as a quantum memory. So it's basically the equivalent of a classical computer's RAM, something where you can take entangled photons, put them into the crystal, and then recall them at will later on and preserve that entanglement. And so this is essential for being used as a buffer memory if you're having a quantum computer, or in the sim most simple case, in a quantum information, uh, quantum communication system, it's being used as a quantum memory to do uh, uh, entanglement swapping and uh, something that's called a quantum repeater. And so this goes to the basic, if you're thinking about trying to transfer quantum information over very long distances, you're sending an entangled single entangled photon down an optical fiber that's hundreds of kilometers long, say. Uh, the problem is, is that you have loss in the fibers, and so the probability of that photon making it to the other end of the line is essentially zero for at a single photon level. So what that means is in order to uh, be able to have any kind of communication cap capacity at links longer than about 100 kilometers, you need some way of breaking this exponential loss that you come into because of the, 
uh, of the loss in the fibers. And so the way that one way of doing this is with what's so-called quantum repeater, where what you do is you break this very long length into, into smaller uh, fundamental links that are on the order of 100 kilometers wide. And you take photon pairs on each one of those links. You have entanglement between those photons, and then you send those photons down the link. Um, and then you send a very large number of those entangled photons so that you're guaranteed that at least one of them will make it to the other end of the link and so that you'll have some entanglement transferred across the link. Now you do that on each one of the links, and then by having success on each one of those individual links and then swapping the entanglement between the photons that are transferred across each of those links, you can transfer the entanglement from the very beginning of the link to the very end of the link. Um, and so this reduces the, the loss of your system from an exponential loss with distance down to a linear loss with distance, which makes it manageable for a practical system. Um, so the, the central element, though, in this kind of a, a, a scheme is this thing that's labeled as a QM here, which is a quantum memory. And that's because I have to send an entangled photon down across this link. Sometimes it makes it here, sometimes it doesn't. If it does make it here, I have to wait until an entangled photon makes it across this link so that I can interfere the two photons with a Bell state measurement to swap the entanglement, make a maximally entangled state between those photons. So what that means is I have to have something here that can take that entangled photon, store it with perfect fidelity without corrupting or losing any of that entanglement information, and then recall it when I find that I've had success and I've had another f entangled photon stored in this other memory coming from the other, other direction. And so this is the, the key element that's needed to make this kind of a communication scheme practical. And so far, the most promising system for doing this is, turns out to be the rare earth uh, materials because of the properties that we uh, mentioned earlier. So one of the, the most basic, uh, I probably I should say one of the most successful implementations of this, the protocol for doing this, is what's called an atomic frequency comb. And so as a specific example, we can look at what's involved in this kind of approach. And so what we do is we start out with our inhomogeneously broadened line, and then we use the spectral tailoring capacity of the material to come in and carve out individual narrow spectral peaks. So we make a frequency comb in the optical spectrum. What this means is that all of the ions that can interact with the light have a very well-defined uh, deterministic relationship between each, between each other in terms of the frequencies. And so that means when a single photon comes in, we have a high bandwidth photon that interacts with all these light, all these ions. That information gets in that single photon gets stored as a superposition across all of those uh, ensemble of rare earth ions in the crystal. And that generates a wave function that looks like this. And then what happens is we can set up by changing the phase of the phase progression of these ions so that this uh, uh, wave function re, uh, rephases and emits the photon with unity probability. And so from people that are familiar with the coherent transient uh, sort of nomenclature, this is really the equivalent of a, a stimulated photon echo process, except with a, a very specific spectrally tailored uh, spectrum, rather than just a sinusoidal spectral grading, you make a frequency comb, and then by setting up phase matching and things, you can actually make your unity, you can make the probability of absorbing a single photon unity, and you can also make the probability of recalling the photon unity. And so this actually gives you a, a possibility of sending in a photon, being guaranteed that it's absorbed, and then having guarantee that it's re-emitted, uh, and then it preserves all of the all of the quantum information stored on the photon as well. So if we want to think about doing this in practice, we, as I said earlier, you need to be sending a lot of photons down these lines in order to have a reasonable amount of uh, information handling capacity. And so one of the simplest ways you can think about that is you split the inhomogeneous line up into a whole series of channels. You create individual atomic frequency combs in each one of these channels. And so you now you can have a whole series of independent channels interacting with uh, spectrally distinct uh, photons that are entangled in each one of these bins, which allows you to generate a very large practical uh, information handling and communication capacity. So obviously we see as we 
design something like this, the width of these features that we can generate, which is related to the, the homogeneous line width or the optical coherence time, the decoherence rate, as well as the entire range of these frequencies, which is the bandwidth or the absorption width of the transitions. Both of those properties are critical in terms of de determining what the performance of this type of system can be. So when we actually look into real materials, there's no, no material yet that solves all of the problems for all protocols. It's a typical problem that you run into whenever you're designing a real, real quantum material, quantum memory material. There's a number of materials that do, that get quite close. And so some of the key issues that you have to consider is you want very long uh, coherence times. You want very slow decoherence, so very slow corruption of the, the quantum states. Um, and so that means you have to understand the dynamic interactions between the rare earth ion and its environment as well as other perturbations uh, to, to those states. You also want very large inhomogeneous broadening, which again is an interaction of how the, the central, the static energy level shifts of the rare earth ion are affected by defects in the crystal, uh, but defects that don't introduce new dynamics into the system, as well as the hyperfine structure, you know, and all these things, with, uh, other things that are required. And in key to all of this is having a better understanding of the microscopic strain and perturbations of the rare earth ions that limit all of these different properties. So. Over the years, we've studied quite a few materials that all of these materials are systems that have, are currently being used in uh, quantum information demonstrations by different groups. Um, and so there's a, a long, long history of understanding some of the basic physics of these and chemistry of these materials. Uh, recently, we wrote uh, a long review article where we tried to combine all of these known properties of these different transitions and different materials uh, with an aspect of what are the specific properties that are needed to be understood for quantum information sort of applications. And so this review article provides uh, a large number of these kind of materials with information such as you know, coherence times and inhomogeneous line widths from work that we've done as well as the extensive work from over the years by a large number of people in the field. So when we think about what, what specifically kind of dynamic processes that we need to consider in terms of how a quantum state that's stored in a rare earth material, how is that degraded by interactions? Um, and so maybe the really simple kind of pedagogical uh, picture that I think is, is useful for understanding what kind of interactions are important uh, for understanding the performance of these systems is just to consider a simple wave function where we have a two-level system, we have a superposition of those two states, and then we have the normal time evolution, so really basic undergraduate uh, quantum mechanics. And so we understand now we have this, this known quantum state how can this quantum state be, the information be corrupted or lost over time? And of course, the most basic thing that everybody will be familiar with is that you have lifetime effects. You have the, the fact that the rare earth ion or the, the, the two-level system couples to the environment at the simplest level, that's coupling to the vacuum states uh, where you can have a mission of a photon, but in reality, that's coupling to pho phonons and other mechanisms that can cause energy to be transferred away from the we're away from the, the center. What that means in practice is these coefficients for these two states change over time and then typically, as you know, the excited state coefficient gets smaller and the ground state coefficient gets larger, which means that you've lost some of the information that you've stored in that state. The next, uh, you know, relatively well understood uh, process that affects the the information stored in the state is perturbations of the quantum state due to things that perturb the phase. So for example, what happens if we have a phonon that comes in, interacts with the electronic states, and then scatters off el elastically so there's no change in the energy. But in the process of that happening, the phase of the state can change. So what this means is this two-level uh, wave function, this has a time-dependent phase over here, which means over time the phase of that wave function is lost, which means when we compare it to an external uh, reference, such as another entangled photon or another ion, uh, they, they don't interfere properly anymore, and so we've lost that information. 
Now a third mechanism, which is generally one of the most important in terms of actually limiting the performance, is energy perturbations, and particularly what we would call spectral diffusion from the analog to traditional spin uh, resonance sort of uh, physics. And so in this case, what's happening is the environment's changing slowly over time, and because of coupling between the environment and the rare earth ion states, uh, the, the two energies of these states change depending on what the, pro, the, the state of the environment is, which means that this energy that goes into the phase progression of the wave function changes over time. So that means as greater time goes by, you have a greater loss of phase coherence between the state that you've stored and your reference state that you're trying to compare it to. And all three of these processes are critical and involve different physics in the material and are different, uh, have different interactions depending on uh, what the limitation is. So, for example, if we go through some of the, the basic me mechanisms that cause this, of course, you have your basic lifetime limit, which, you know, from simple uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you can relate the coherence time to the uh, excited state lifetime. You also have interactions with phonons, which can include both uh, elastic as well as inelastic scattering of photons with the uh, phonons, with the inelastic scattering again adding to the T1. The spectral diffusion interactions, also interactions with uh, dynamic instabilities in the lattice. So this is when you have, uh, we'll go into this a little more uh, shortly, but um, you can have uh, defects in the lattice which cause you to have multiple uh, possibility, multiple configurations and the system can fluctuate between those and change the energy of the rare earth ion. And you can also, due to the fact that the light is interacting with the material, that interaction itself can perturb the ions and cause the interaction between the ions uh, to lead to spectral diffusion. So the way that we measure these sorts of interactions and study the, the processes that are limiting the coherence lifetimes is generally time domain uh, measurements, and particularly photon echo type measurements. And so for those of you that aren't familiar with photon echoes, it's very easy to think about it in terms of an analog of thinking about a Fabry-Pro cavity. So if I have a simple uh, Fabry-Pro cavity with two, two mirrors, I send in a pulse. That pulse bounces around in the cavity, and each time it hits the mirror, a pulse comes out, which the amplitude of that determining of what the, is related to what the reflectivity of the mirrors are, is, or what the Q of the, the cavity is. And so by measuring the exponential decay of the amplitude of these pulses, I can actually determine what the resonance width of the cavity is. This is a classic way of uh, characterizing a Fabry-Pro cavity, a cavity ring down spectra, as it would be called. In the case of the rare earth material, the optical transition, you have exactly mathematically the same analog, except where we come in, we prepare the material with an initial pulse, and then we send in a pulse, a second pulse, that pulse gets reflected or uh, emitted by, from the material and then decays exponentially over time. And by measuring the exponential decay of that recalled information, we actually determine the homogeneous line width of the optical transitions, essentially the Q of the, the ions in the material. Uh, and mathematically, it turns out to be exactly the same kind of relationship. So we can do this kind of measurement, change the time between our pulses, see the decay of that recalled coherence coherent uh, information and see an exponential decay, which then we can fit and then uh, by the, the simple Fourier arguments to extract what is the coherence lifetime of the ion or what is the homogeneous line width of the individual centers in the, in the crystal. And so this is a case for europium Y203 where actually we're getting down to essentially the lifetime, the radiative lifetime limit of the ion, which is one of the very few cases where you get close to having a radiatively limited uh, coherence lifetime where the radiative limited on the zero phonon transition. So. So now we combine all these things together. Um, so we need to know that if we want to store high bandwidth information in a crystal, that our maximum signal bandwidth that we can store is less than whatever the inhomogeneous broadening. So what it, it's determined by what the range of static perturbations in the environment is. Um, 
also because the coherence of the ensemble, the coherent information that we store in the material is related, is, requires all of the ions to maintain a deterministic phase relationship with each other, which means that they're looking at the two level quantum information uh, picture means that uh, the phase information of that uh, superposition state is not lost. But that means that we need to minimize these uh, dynamic perturbations or have our coherence lifetime as long as possible. So when you actually go through and look at a real material, the actual behavior becomes much more complicated than the simple kind of uh, exponential decay picture. So what you can have is at higher temperatures, because of scattering of pho phonons, both elastic and inelastic scattering of phonons, you have very rapid exponential decay, which means you have a broad homogeneous line width due to these phonon perturbations. As you start cooling the material down, uh, what you can do is freeze out many of those phonon interactions because now the phonons that are required in particular for the resonant interactions are not occupied anymore. Uh, so then you're looking at higher order phonon interactions. And so then, your pho then you start to see the coherence lifetime get longer, but then now it's no longer exponential. And this is a characteristic behavior of spectral diffusion. So what this means is rather than having a phase perturbation like a phonon scattering event, we're having an energy perturbation. That energy perturbation takes time for it to generate a phase uh, error. And so what that means is initially we start out with a very slow decay and then the decay accelerates. So we had accelerating decoherence because we're perturbing the energy and then the energy times the time gives us the phase error. And then you can go long enough where you can have enough perturbations where they start to average out and you can get the effects of motional narrowing, which is the analog of motional narrowing and spin resonance. And then if we put a magnetic field on, we, in, some case, in this particular case, we can inhibit many of these dynamic interactions. In this case, the interactions being due to uh, nuclear spin flips in the lattice. Uh, this is an example, I think, for thulium lithium niobate. Uh, and so then what happens is the decay gets very long, but now we start to see uh, coherent modulations of the recalled coherence. And this is because of interference between different uh, optical transitions that are overlapping. So in this particular case, we have uh, lithium spins, so the rare earth ion couples to lithium. Every time we absorb a photon, we have a probability of simultaneously inducing a flip of the lithium spin as well as driving the optical transition. So now that means that we have a multi-level system and we have quantum interference between those different pathways, which leads to a modulation in the recovered coherence properties. So now if we saw one of the key aspects as we go down to the low temperature and we go to the good uh, conditions where we expect really good properties, spectral diffusion is really our limiting factor. And so there we saw its effect in uh, the optical coherence properties. Uh, in this case, this is a very simple picture of what that corresponds to in the time domain. That means initially we have all these ions that have the same homogeneous line width. Um, now because of perturbations in the environment, which are different for different ions at different places in the crystal, that a uh, homogeneous ensemble begins to broaden into a, a wider packet. Some ions go one way, some ions go the other way, which means their collective phase information is lost. And then over time, that spectral information that was stored uh, is lost. And this can be driven any time you have the rare earth ion coupling to an environment that has a dynamics associated with it, whether that's electron spins, movement of defects in the lattice, uh, movement of electrons in the lattice, all of these things will lead to spectral diffusion mechanisms. Uh, the simplest case, uh, one that's actually simple enough that you can really quantitatively model this, is uh, uh, interaction with paramagnetic centers, in particular electron or nuclear spins. This is an example for erbium, where we have erbium center over here, and then we have a, a number of uh, magnetic spins, in the, uh, spins with magnetic moments in the environment. As their, their spin states change, that changes the local magnetic field at the erbium ion, which changes the, the splitting between the levels due to the Zeeman effect, which causes the energy to change, which causes the decoherence. So, with this kind of a mechanism, we can actually model this quantitatively in terms of what the, both the dynamics that are driving the spin flips as well as what the interaction strength between the different centers are. And we can apply this kind of uh, 
model to understand, for example, in this case, we put a magnetic field on, and then we look at the homogeneous line width or the decoherence rate of the ions, we can quantitatively model that, and you actually can see very surprising behavior. In particular, a uh, very classic uh, example due to this magnetic interaction causing spectral diffusion is you get a local maximum in the decoherence. And this is because you have an interaction as you turn the magnetic field up, you start to freeze out spins, you preferentially align them or reduce the maximum entropy of the spin system, but you also cause, because of the Zeeman effect, the splittings get larger, so you have larger energies that can access higher density of phonon states, thinking about the mega squared Debye density of states in the crystal, and so that means that the flips get faster, so you get less and less flips, but the ones that you do have go faster and faster, and this leads to this kind of complex behavior. And this actually gives you insight into the microscopic dynamics of what centers are interacting with what other centers because you can go through and you can change the concentration of different ions, you can change the magnetic field, you can change the temperature, you can look at all these things and then you can put this model together and then see that it explains all of the behavior over all of this multidimensional parameter space which gives you really an unambiguous picture of what really is the dynamics that are limiting the coherence properties. And so in this case you can see uh, at very high fields, I have interactions with nuclear spins. This is, uh, let's see, this is lithium niobate, erbium and lithium niobate. So the erbium interacting with lithium and niobium nuclear spins limits the coherence at very high fields. At intermediate fields, I have direct phonon process driving erbium spin flips. Uh, and then the interaction between erbium and the environment and the erbium I'm interacting with optically gives me this behavior. And then at very low fields, I have erbium flip, uh, mutual erbium flip-flops. So where two erbium that are anti-parallel with each other can spontaneously exchange their spin states, which changes the local field distributions. So traditional uh, electron spin diffusion, uh, causing spectral diffusion in that case. So I can also have, as I alluded to earlier, this uh, uh, dynamic disorder modes in the crystal. So this is a behavior that's very characteristic of glasses, uh, a model that was first developed by uh, uh, Phillips and, and Anderson to describe uh, anomalous heat capacity in glasses with the idea that in a, a crystal that has defects, as soon as I perturb that ideal perfect crystal symmetry, what I've done is I weaken some of the bonds in the crystal and I also introduce the capability to have multiple bond configurations that have very nearly equivalent energy with some kind of a potential barrier in between those configurations. Uh, and so, of course, this leads to the well-known, you know, low thermal conductivity and high heat capacity of glassy materials. But what we find is when you look at coherence properties, they're so sensitive to any kind of dynamics in the crystal that you can find that even in the most high quality crystal you look at, there can be evidence of these kinds of uh, two level systems. The density is many, many orders of magnitude lower than you would get in a glass, but there's still some amorphous nature just to the due to the fact that you have some kind of defects present in these crystals. Uh, and so then you can go through and, you know, for example, compare how the crystals were made or how they were treated and see there can be variations in, uh, in the coherence properties due to uh, that sort of uh, mechanism going on. So as a practical example that we've thought about recently, uh, looking at powders, this becomes very, very significant. And of course, uh, people like Sergey here in the audience is, has looked at this quite a bit with Europium Y203 in the past. Recently, what we looked at is, you know, what kind of, what are the limits where you can, you know, get away without introducing defects into powders as you fabricate them. And so what we've done here, as we start with a bulk single crystal from scientific materials is really high quality, no measurable level of these two level systems in the system. What we, we get is the, when we look at the nuclear spin lifetime by doing spectral hole burning, the lifetime can be as long as almost a thousand minutes. So very, very long lived nuclear spin states. Um, and also the homogeneous line widths are 100 kilohertz or narrow or limited by spectral diffusion due to interaction with the aluminum spins. Um, now what we do is we can take this kind of a crystal and at the simplest level we just crush it up into you know, relatively large pieces. These are pieces on the order of you know, 50 to 100 micron size crystallites, so by no means nanocrystals, still relatively large bulk crystals. And just the act of crushing this crystal without doing anything chemically to it or anything else reduces this nuclear spin lifetime from nearly 1,000 minutes down to 20 minutes. 
So a dramatic effect on the, the lifetime of the nuclear spin storage, which is quite surprising. Also at the same time, the homogeneous line width of the optical transition increases to megahertz. And so what this means is that just this fact of introducing strain by smashing the crystal up, I have introduced two level systems, a glassy type amorphous behavior at a level way below anything that you would measure by x-ray diffraction or you know, even heat capacity type measurements, but enough that with these kind of hole burning measurements, we can very, very easily see a dramatic change in the properties. So when we have the particles that are this, there's this weakly perturbed by you know, breaking them into these large pieces, we can mostly recover the bulk properties if we anneal them and we're careful about the atmosphere we anneal them and we can mostly get back to the properties of this bulk crystal, although never entirely back to those properties. But now if we start breaking the crystals even smaller, which we think is inducing more strain and more defects in the lattice, in this case, we never get, we, we get much worse properties, plus after we anneal and we do whatever processing we've tried so far, we never get back to the properties of the bulk crystal. With exactly the same material, the only difference being we, we crush it a little bit longer to make the particles smaller. So uh, we can also start the other approach, and so instead of starting with a bulk crystal and smashing it down, we can start with uh, materials and grow the crystals up with the idea that should minimize the strain. Um, and what we find is we can get crystals that look great if we look at T, uh, if we look at uh, things like SEM or TEM or XRD, and, you know, all the properties are Raman spectra, everything looks great. But then when we look at the coherence properties, it's terrible. There's no comparison. So in this case where we have uh, particles where we've calcined at low temperature to keep the particle size small, we actually don't even see hole burning. The homogeneous watt broadening and the spin lifetime is so short that it's not even measurable in that case. And then if we anneal longer and we include some uh, fluxes and do more tricks in order to make the particles better, we get these very, very nice, uh, in this case this is thulium yag, uh, so we get the very nice dodecahedral habit of the crystals and very nice properties in terms of their x-ray diffraction, but still the lifetime is only on the order of two minutes and uh, the whole width is 26 megahertz, so horrible properties compared to the bulk crystals. And so what this tells us, at least in some cases, the hole burning approaches and looking at the optical coherence that we would apply to quantum memory memories can be a very, very sensitive measure of the material quality and might give us new insights into what makes a good material or what makes a bad material. And particularly what we would like to do, and this is one of the things that we're working on, is trying to apply this type of approach to looking at more traditional luminescent materials like phosphors and say, does this explain some difference in performance? Uh, can we correlate the spectral hole burning coherence properties with room temperature kind of luminescence properties such as quenching and, and other, other aspects? So we can also extend this by doing more complicated pulse sequences. We can look at coherence over time. Uh, which is, uh, in this case, a stimulated echoes. We can ma map out what the decoherence varies over different time scales. This, again, gives us an entirely another new dimension to look at what the interactions between the rare earth center is and the defects or the other impurities in the crystal. Uh, and so then we can combine this with theoretical models to fit the behavior over things like temperature, over different time scales, over magnetic fields, match those models up, which allows us to distinguish which mechanisms are the ones that are important, which ones do we need to target, and how do we need to manipulate the composition or the structure of the material in order to maximize the properties at any particular set of conditions. Um, let me skip over the instantaneous spectral diffusion. Interaction with the uh, uh, phonons and the crystals also critical in terms of heating effects and other things if we're thinking about coherence properties. Um, so, and also one of the particularly Im important places for introducing defects into the crystal in order to manipulate the properties and design it for an application is manipulating the static environment, manipulating uh, the inhomogeneous broadening. And so what we would like to do is have the maximum inhomogeneous broadening possible to have the maximum information handling capacity of the material. Uh, so the simplest way is we can introduce more uh, rare earth dopant ions, which introduce defects and introduce strain in the lattice. And so in this case, if we just put more thulium in, the lines get broader, we get pair lines, and we get an increase. Ideally, what we'd want to do is thinking about the analog with compositional tuning and laser materials. 
uh, where if we change the host composition a little bit, we can shift the, the laser transition frequency around, which is something that we, we did a number of years ago for uh, remote sensing applications. You can apply the same thing to hole burning. So you say, in this case, I have a material like uh, yttrium aluminum garnet, where this is the absorption line, a material like lutetium aluminum garnet, where this is the line. Now if we take a solid solution of those two materials, a mixed composition, we can actually increase the inhomogeneous broadening to span that entire range and dramatically increase our information handling capacity. So the problem with that is, is that depending on what the mechanisms and what kind of defects we introduce, we can actually introduce new dynamics. So in this case of thulium uh, in the, the, this y egg mixture, we see that as we change the thulium composition and the lutetium composition, we also change the interaction strength with the phonons in the lattice. And so we actually can change the thermal decoherence, uh, which can have important consequences for the applications. Also, depending on what kind of defects we're introducing in the lattice, we don't necessarily get a continuous distribution. We can also get individual defects where they have a very well-defined local symmetry, uh, but a number of different sites. And so this is a, a very nice, uh, neat comparison where here we have urban lithium lithium niobate, uh, which has defects due to the lithium vacancies, uh, the natural lithium deficiency and congruent lithium niobate. Um, and then at the same time, we have KTP, which has very similar kind of uh, potassium deficiency issues. And if we shift these to be at the same wavelength, we see that the, while the lithium niobate has this very broad continuous distribution and all the rare earth ions across this distribution have very similar properties, slightly different, but the coherence is comparable, the lifetimes are comparable. In the case of the KTP, we end up with a whole series of very, very sharp lines, which has the, actually the same total span of energy perturbations, but a very discrete nature of the perturbations. And so obviously, this kind of a case with lithium niobate is ideal for uh, coherent transient type applications, whereas this case is much less ideal since you can only interact with the specific frequencies. So also as you start introducing these defects, you can get dynamics. So in this case, presidimium lithium niobate, you can broaden that line out to 1.2 terahertz, which I think is the largest in a single, uh, in single crystal that I know of. Um, but you also at the same time start introducing these two level systems because you've introduced so much strain into the lattice. Um, this also can also have good consequences for your coherence properties. So by increasing this inhomogeneous broadening, you can disrupt the resonance between spins so that you can inhibit spin diffusion, which actually can cause your spectral diffusion to be reduced as well. And so by having a balance between you know, disrupting spectral diffusion and preventing, uh, introducing new dynamics, you can actually improve the properties of your material. Um, so, let's see. And so if we apply this to uh, one of the cases that we've been working on recently with uh, Wolfgang Tittle's group, we can go through a series where we start out with thulium lithium niobate, which they've used for their, their nature demonstrations of uh, an entire end-to-end -end, uh, quantum memory uh, system for entangled photons with very high fidelity. Um, by applying our basic understanding of the spectral diffusion physics uh, that's going on in the lithium niobate case, we were able to extend the coherence lifetime significantly to give them longer storage. So they were starting out with sub-microsecond storage. We got up to hundreds of microsecond storage. And then by moving to a different host and manipulating what the host composition is and the nature of the states, so we can go to a material, in this case, particularly thulium gallium, or an yttrium gallium garnet rather than yttrium aluminum garnet. Uh, we can increase this further, and so we've got up to, this says 490 microseconds, but we've extended that up to uh, around 600 microseconds now. And actually, we believe by studying the, the temperature and the magnetic field dependence in these properties that that limit is limited by these two level systems in the crystal. So as we can improve the composition, reduce the strain, and make a more pure crystal, we actually expect this coherence lifetime to be extended up to a millisecond. And so for reference, if we're making a 100 kilometer long uh, quantum link in a uh, quantum repeater system, that corresponds to a storage time that we need on the 
order of a few hundred microseconds. Um, and so this means that getting up into the milliseconds or hundreds of microseconds is ideal in order to store the quantum information, the time that it takes to send a photon and then send another photon if that one uh, is not successful. And so this is a very large multi-dimensional parameter space covering a large area of physics from, you know, more traditional kind of spin dynamics and, you know, even magnetic uh, physics of the rare earth ions to the optical physics and optical coherent transients in order to optimize, understand how do defects in the crystal affect the properties, uh, both dynamic and static properties, and what the interplay between those properties are. Uh, and with that, I'd, I'd like to end and thank all of the people that we've had working on this and the companies that we work on very closely, as well as all of our really great international collaborators. Thank you. Thank you very much for Charles for your excellent presentation. Very nice. A lot of information. So it's open for Thank you. Well, I would like uh, to ask you about the uh, um, whole burning process. So it, uh, it appears that you need a metastable state. So for having, uh, 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 let's say, whole burning times of about minutes or weeks, what kind of metastable state you have? Second question concerning it. How this metastable state can be so strongly influenced by thermal treatments, as you have mentioned? And third, do you think that this kind of process can also appear dealing with, for instance, ruby, let's say, where 3D ions are not rare ions are involved? Thank you. Sir. Yes, so uh, starting out with the, the first question, um, let me see if I can, I can remember back to the first one. Let's see. Uh, maybe I'll start out with the last one first. That's, that's an easier question. So thinking about uh, Ruby, this is actually the R lines in Ruby are one of the very few cases where you really do have rare earth equivalent properties with the transition metal. Uh, and just so the, the nature of the, those states, uh, it's, it's, it's exactly the same mechanisms that come in. So the coherence times are not quite as long, but you're still up into the, the tens of my, to 100 microsecond regime. Uh, and so that's actually uh, uh, all the same arguments apply to that case. But that's kind of an outlier among the, the transition metals. Um, and it's, it's an interesting one, though. Um, in terms of the uh, storage mechanisms and how the, they can be affected by the thermal processing and the treatment, um, in that case, what we're thinking is you have a two-level system. Whenever you have uh, these energy levels that are split by energies that are comparable to the nuclear spin splittings, then you can have uh, essentially like a spin diffusion process, except uh, the state of this two-level structural uh, dynamic mode being exchanged with the spin mode. And so the spin energy gets transferred to that state. And so then you can cause a, relax, a new relaxation mechanism. And so this is actually known in the regime of electron spin resonance and, and to a lesser extent in the nuclear spin resonance experiments where you can see if you go to glassy materials, you generally have very fast uh, T1 relaxations in those systems as well. Now thinking in terms of the, uh, the long-term storage mechanisms, even in the case of if you go to erbium, the excited state lifetime can be 10 milliseconds. And actually in this thulium YGG case, if you work on the 1.7 micron transition, the lifetime of that uh, transition is 60 milliseconds. And so at that level, if you're looking at this kind of simple quantum memory application, 60 milliseconds is way more time than you need to store that entangled photon information. And so that's good enough. But depending on other applications, you know, there's a lot of schemes where they use the nuclear spin states for storage. And that gives you the advantage that uh, particularly in cases like europium where you have the J equals zero ground state and so you have a very weak interaction with the environment typically, the lifetime of those spin states in the right kind of material, a low spin host, can be weeks or months and other mechanisms that can give you similar kind of uh, storage times besides nuclear spins are things like dynamic rearrangement of the environment. So you can, one example we've done is where you can dope deuterium into calcium fluoride, and then by exciting the information, you can, tra uh, exciting the rare earth ion, the information, the energy can be transferred to the deuterium ion and move its position in the lattice, which causes a permanent frequency shift. In that case, the storage is essentially permanent as long as you stay below that thermal barrier for the local 
defect a move. The problem with those kind of uh, approaches typically is that when you start moving things around in the lattice, even though it gives you very, very high energy barriers and very long-lived holes, it also causes large perturbations in the crystal through the long-range multipole interactions. And so that can actually cause spectral diffusion on the other ions in the crystal, which causes your coherence properties to be degraded. So that's why the nuclear spin storage is really the best mechanism if you want minutes or hours or weeks storage times. So, so thank you so much for your nice presentation, Professor Thiel. Uh, I was astonished that in your demonstration, you have shown a lot of results with lithium niobate or with KTP, where you substitute three plus uh, cations with uh, one plus lithium three plus or potassium three plus. And so in lithium niobate, there are three kinds of site. It is very well known. And also much more because you have to compensate. Yeah. So uh, why you don't uh, try to give a model, right model, only with... Uh, for example, tulium 3 plus dot uh, YAG in such kind of crystals. So yeah, I mean, this is exactly the reason why lithium niobate is such an interesting, uh, really great system to work on. Uh, because there's so much variability and so much uh, complexity. I mean, it's also why it's a headache to work on in some cases. So in the case of uh, the erbium, I mean, we know from people like John Wright, and they've you know, done lots of, uh, you know, and of course, uh, Volkmar here has done a lot of work as well, but uh, this, uh, there's a lot of different sites. But in terms of the optical coherence, it turns out that the properties of those sites, even though the center energies are perturbed and there's slight differences in the environment, the properties are more or less the same. And so we can go through from one side to the other, and the coherence properties, at least, have similar behaviors, the lifetimes, the storage, these mechanisms. Now, if we go to thulium lithium niobate, which is a slide that I jumped over really quickly, completely opposite case. And so in that case, because of the C3 symmetry, you end up with an unusual case where you have a non cromers ion that has a time reversal degeneracy, which is very, very sensitive to the perturbation of the environment. In that case, you get this really large complex structure uh, that corresponds to different subsites that have split doublets. And each one of those sites has completely different hyperfine interactions. They have t the similar excited state lifetimes. The coherence properties are not too different, although they vary. But the ion ion interactions, the nuclear spin storage times, the hyperfine structure is very, very different. And that makes that system very difficult to work on. And we've actually modeled in quite a bit of detail with a lot of excitation spectroscopy combined with the coherence measurements to show how the coherence properties across that transition can be understood in terms of exactly those inequivalent uh, underlying sites. And so that, that's quite important. In the case of uh, things like the garnets, where you have anti-site defects and all this other complex structure, uh, the, the mechanism that leads to the broader inhomogeneous uh, line width seems to be far enough away perturbations that it's not significantly affecting the nature of the energy levels. Whereas when you, you look down closer in the details, you see all of the individual defect lines that you can resolve, and then their properties are quite different. And you can see you know, nearest neighbors and next nearest neighbors and all of those things by changing the concentrations and distinguish those. And they, and they have very different properties. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. I have a particular question. You mentioned that the disorder and the local stress, it's uh, changing the coherence and, uh, of, and the line width. And you proved by crushing the uh, crystal. That's a rather brutal method of inducing. Have you thinking about trying to get a material with a more controlled uh, uh, induced stress and disorder by preparing uh, nanocrystalline materials. There you can have it in a controlled ma uh, matter. Have you tried this procedure? Yes, uh, we've, we've, that was actually the reason for doing this crystal uh, uh, crushing is we were trying to go to the nanocrystal regime in order specifically to look at uh, phonon uh, suppression effects from freezing out uh, uh, phonon modes in the small particles. And what we found is you know, the properties varied so much that we had to go back to the bigger crystals. And as we go to bigger and bigger crystals, we still see these effects. Yes. I mean, these are effects that we even see in bulk crystals. So for example, you know, in the case of europium YSO, we can have six crystals grown by scientific materials, grown in nominally the same way, same properties. 
And what we find is out of those six crystals, one of them has this kind of behavior of these two level system, uh, you know, linear temperature dependence, which is characteristic of these kind of uniform distribution of low level dynamic modes. And it's not understood what's causing that, whether it's a difference in the oxygen vacancy density, whether it's, you know, residual strain because of how the crystal was cooled. And so we've done a couple of, I mean, we've tried to start to probe this more systematically. And we can find some of these behaviors can be intro introduced by very, very weak perturbations on the crystal. Um, and so in particular, some of the cases like erbium, uh, lithium, uh, uh, yttrium fluoride, we've had, where we have very, very narrow lines, then you can see that very small changes of the crystal can cause perturbations of the inhomogeneous line, which then are correlated to some of these behaviors. And so that, uh, it's a really interesting topic, and it's one that we really want to explore more, but it's a very complicated yes, topic to yes. figure out exactly what's going on, particularly to characterize, you know, when we have this strain, is it just a mechanical strain, or is there, you know, chemical compositions that interplay between defects in the lattice and the mechanical strain, or is it just mechanical strain by itself? So, thank you. <laughs>